I'll start recording. Thank you, though. Appreciate the heads up. Uh, I guess the uh, the internet in our class really doesn't need to relive that, but just kind of interesting stuff. I know that I give you the farm report all the time, um, and it's different out here in the country. And I would say this: the road, the main roads out here that Randy plowed, because there's not that many neighbors, was super easy once I did get out. And I went in town yesterday to drop Storm off so that he could go sledding with some friends. And town is a mess. Like the neighborhoods within the neighborhoods. Holy cow. I mean, I, I could have bottomed out my forerunner several times. I just told him to walk an extra couple blocks because it was, oh, it was bad. So I assume uh, everybody's out kind of digging themselves out. Out here, it's not, not so bad now that we got uh, off the road. So I hope you had some fun yesterday. The school took an actual snow day. Uh, I believe the results for the exam were released. Thumbs up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I can't remember if we gave back a few points or not um, for any questions that, that popped up. Four points. Yep. Okay. I got a lot of emails this morning. Uh, I didn't have power for uh, a full day and then just got to kind of the internet thing. You should have seen my kids though on Sunday night after like 15 hours without the internet. <laughs> I like I saw actually like PlayStation sweat start to come out of their like their pores and stuff and I was I was like oh we're not gonna have power for days definitely not the internet I was like totally messing with them and they, they were just about to break they're not as tough as us kids from the 70s all right nobody is really uh so uh you've got four points back the test scores looked good overall um yeah I pretty much what was promised I hope it was easier uh, because it was over two chapters, maybe. I'm hoping that's the case, at least that it wasn't uh, too bad for everybody. It looks good. Uh, now is an excellent time to donate to the food bank. And um, I don't think I, I haven't said this to any class yet. I'm not supposed to say this yet. So I definitely can't tell the department yet, but it's just us, right? It's just us out here. Uh, I think, I think uh, we're going to win a big award. Um, I got an email from the school and I think uh, my students and the Larimer County Food Bank and I'm in there somewhere anyway, we're all gonna be recognized for this uh, food drive thing that we've been doing. Somebody caught wind of it, nominated us for this big CSU award. And uh, normally it would be in a ballroom and I might have to give a speech and the president of the college would be there and then I'd probably divert and talk about like, you know, the environmental changes I want on campus and then I might get drug out of there. So anyway, it's probably a good thing that it's virtual this year. No, uh, but, but yeah, so donate, donate. Uh, Cause we've been feeding people and I'm super proud of my students and I can, I even had to submit a headshot. Yeah, yeah. So we actually had to create one because if you've seen my hair, let me go. I'm going to let me mute my, uh, stop my video for a second. This is the only picture that exists of me without shades that would somewhat even be acceptable um, <laughs> for anything like an award ceremony. So I put on a tie even. Yep. Uh, and uh, turned in some pictures from previous semesters where my students were like taking mass amounts of food out when we used to do that. But we adapted this last year virtually and, and provided, you know, I don't know, 18,000 meals last semester, uh, you know, nine in the spring. So another, I mean, you know, just almost 30,000 meals. And so, yeah, uh, I will let you know when that is. And then we have some money for the social department. So if you happen to be a member of the social department or an undergraduate, there's some monetary award that goes with this too. Uh, and I'm going to use my money to buy a chainsaw for all the trees that just broke off. Uh, anyway, okay, let's get to this next chapter. Um, keep that on the down low. Uh, as I publish this to our YouTube channel right after class. Keep it on the download. As somebody's watching from like, I don't know. Do you know, sometimes people are watching from like this class to get social from like the most interesting places in the world. And I get a random email once in a while. I'm watching your class from Ghana. And so anyway, hey, uh, hopefully people are learning a lot of sociology. All right, so I'm not really sure. Let me look back here. Uh, if there's anything, I feel like there's a little lull here. Uh, so first post by, so dive, no, we're on that. We did that. We turned in that. We've got the essay. I mean, you know, if you ever have a bit of a lull like this, um, for your classes, uh, the food waste paper is something that we'll talk about on, I guess, um, I guess we'll talk about the food waste paper on 
Thursday, although I don't know, it might be a good time right now. Let me look it up here. Okay. All right. I think we should do this. Yeah, I'm going to talk about it. Um, I, I do this with my 100 time and time again and talk about the paper and talk about the paper and talk about the paper. I have not because this is a 200 level class. People generally speaking have written more papers. They're a little bit more on top of it. Usually they're further along in their education. But I think it's worth talking about here because if we have a little bit of a lull or a break, um, even in a small way for this class, it's good to start writing this thing. Okay. Um, cause we'll be closing in on, I guess we are closing in on just under a month. So food waste paper, this is worth 150 points, which is like an exam and a half. Um, and when you have something that you could prepare for ahead of time, write, send us rough drafts. I'm going to give you a few sources. Uh, and I'll, I'll do that. Let me write this down right after class. I'll throw those sources up the extra sources. And, um, this is something that you can do well on because you can plan for it in advance. So if you want a strategy to improve your grade, this is it, right? Something that you can plan in advance for. You can bounce your rough drafts off of me or the GTAs who've been grading your work, even the writing center. So this is a two space, two page single space essay, um, but I'm, I'm gonna talk about the different parts of it because it's got a di couple different parts. So. To examine the sociology and relationship of food and food waste in our culture. If you've had my 100, we really look at our relationship with food, but now because of this class, we're looking at the component of waste and food waste, right? Um, so we know a little bit about that from Dive. What elements contribute to our food waste or to prevention of our waste? What food systems contribute to that? What practices do we have to help save or waste food? Um, could be something as simple as you know your workplace is independently owned and they have a really fantastic recycling program, your Olive Garden or Darden restaurants and you have nothing, right? Or hopefully vice versa, you know, there's some big companies out there that have that plan in place, but that's just like, what, what's, what are some food waste mechanisms in place? We know that some restaurants and some places, uh, supermarkets or whatever, grocery stores, uh, have plans and they donate daily to like the food bank or food banks around there. What does that look like? And then the system, dating, uh, food dating, not not other types of dating, uh, food dating. And I don't know, there's probably a dating app just for people who love organic food. So I've just copyrighted that idea. We'll call it food dating with only one D. It's all one word. And but no, sorry. I'm easily sidetracked by new ideas. All right, so um, what is being done to draw attention to this topic being proposed? Is there resistance to it? I just saw this morning that a couple of people who are running for president and vice president of CSU have actually diversion of food waste uh, on their platform to feed people. Um, so this is something that you, know, you could look at up close and personal in your community, uh, on campus, and there are two parts to it. So it's due April 12th, submitted on Canvas only. Everything is submitted here uh, electronically. In, in times past, when we would meet in person, maybe people would wonder about that. But now you've, you've probably gotten used to submitting most things online. Um, you must have at least seven sources. We're going to provide at least three of those for you. The textbook is another source. That dive movie could be another source. So really, you know, we're providing a lot of that so that you know that you've got some solid stuff to write this paper with in the first place. So there's two parts to it. And right now I'm just on the assignments page under assignments page under food waste. So if you're if you want to follow along, I'm I'm I can, we're here. Let me screen share. Never mind. If you want to follow along. Uh, I thought we were on spring break. Okay. Can you see this here? Yes? No? Yes. Okay. So uh, here, here it is. There's two sections to this, and they're each two pages single space. So this is a four page single space paper. First of all, conduct research on food waste. What are our cultural food practices, food production? Um, what efforts are made to waste or reduce that waste? Okay. Um, and I'm providing you with some peer reviewed articles, journals that there are going to be links to. And I've got some directions for it. When you try and open up some of these, if you're on campus, if you're off, once in a while, they might try and ask you to pay, but you never have to pay. If it won't open with one browser, just try another one. But I'm providing you with some of this. And I have here, don't search the first page of Google. Um, it's just, you know, you have the library, you have some better search engines 
for more scholarly, uh, you know, sources than to just go on Google and be like, whatever. So compile your research and type a two page essay that addresses these issues and topics. Okay. Um, and I have said that we have four sources that are required for this assignment, but I think it's three um, that I provide. So seven total though. All right, so that is about what are our cultural practices around food waste mechanisms. You're doing some research with this piece. Uh, Organicmatch.com is a brand new dating service, certified organic people who love the. There, sorry about that. Just had to close my own mouth as I read this. Organicmatch.com. Well, so be it. Uh, <laughs> this seems like the class to advertise that. Uh, okay. So food production, waste, what's being done, what's not being done, talk about it and research it. Then number two, uh, using detailed research and a sociological foundation. You are all, you're past the halfway point here, you're professional sociologist. And you, know, you can include your own insight, propose pragmatic solutions to our food waste details or food waste issues in details. What is being done, why, how to reduce it, specifically what is your plan, where would it be implemented and how? Now, I don't, I have the sociological relevance here, but it, it really does match up with all of our classes, uh, all the goals for this class, um, and really for other classes, research and writing and food waste, a topic that we've identified is a, is a big piece here. Um, so four pages total. Yep, you each, to each one of those is two pages. And I'm just helping you split it up or think of it as two different sections. One, which is heavy on research. Two, which is heavy on the proposal. And it's, you know, twice the solution page, because normally you write one page twice. So I want you to go that much more in depth. Whether that means talking to the composting people and the food waste people here on campus or in the school district of Poudre School District, because you want to stop that food waste and redirect it for composting, maybe as a model, but in the school district like CSU does, whatever that might be, however that might be, um, it has to be as specific as possible. So we start with this big broad topic of food waste and we get more specific and more specific and more specific. Now you've been practicing this already um, because you've been writing solution papers. So, all right, let's do April 12th. That's just under a month. It's got two sections. Uh, any questions? I will yes. take break. Go ahead. Are we looking for one specific solution or are we just uh, like researching and writing about how different solutions are being used? I think that once you do the first part, the research and writing about, you know, food waste in general, then that should open up something that you should focus on. So like a solution. Yep, and be as specific again as possible. And I'd like this, you know, could you implement it? How would we implement it? It doesn't have to, again, the more pragmatic, you don't have to think of something completely brand new. I think there's a lot of things and a lot of ways that we waste in food that you'll, when you're doing research and reading these articles, you'd be like, oh, well, that, that gives me that, that audience or that demographic, or, you know, here, here's what would help this group of people or how we could, you know, if CSU does it, Imagine if all the grade schools in town or in the Poudre School District did it. So how would you implement it? Who might you talk to? I don't know, you know, what are some obstacles to it? But yep, be as specific as possible for sure. And I think a lot of those potential things that you're gonna address, solutions, uh, might be revealed in the research in part one. Does that answer that? Yes, it does, thank you. Yep, absolutely, great question. Other questions? Can we focus on food waste in another country specifically? Sure. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Uh, what were you thinking of? Um, I don't know, like, right now off the top of my head, I just sure. thought it would be interesting from an international perspective to just, like, pick one country and kind of look into their problems that they have with it. Yeah, and uh, or, and or solutions. Uh, uh, there's a lot of places in Europe that are a lot more creative than we are. Um, with food waste and a lot more dedicated to it. So yeah, I think looking at what's being done with food waste, you could even mention that in that first section. You know, here's something that we're not doing. Here's something that I found that someplace else is. This leads us to a big gap. There's a lot of cognitive dissonance and a lot of need. Here's what I propose. Absolutely. Oh, my students, you're all fantastic. Excellent. Yes. What else? Other questions? Uh, I have a question. Um, it was also in the chat. 
Uh, so I'm a little bit confused. Are we doing two whole pages or four whole pages? Uh, section one has two pages and section okay. two has two pages. So four. Okay. Total. Thank yep. you. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know what's going to Oh, go ahead, Samuel. Go ahead. Is this going to change anything about like class structure with the daily or with the by with the twice a week lectures or is it just going to be on top of the standard class? Yeah, no, this is, yep, this is just listed under assignments. I think it's been there since the very beginning. So it's just something that you work on. Um, I think that we talked about some food waste in the waste chapter, uh, dive a little bit. And then, like I said, I'll provide some of that, but, but uh, I'm not going to be getting too much more into that. Although we are going to, we have a chapter coming up on food, but yep, this is just an assignment part of the class. This would be the sort of big, the big paper for this semester. So then the paper should be all one paper, four pages, right? Not two separate papers, two pages. Like it should just flow into, yeah, okay. Cool. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it, any time that you can put everything in one document, just better. From the, from the perspective of myself and GTAs who are going through hundreds of papers, and if I have to open up like 400 documents versus 200. <laughs> so definitely all in the same document. That's a great question, Amy. As I lean into the camera, have you seen the super bling hat that I got just the other day? Ooh, that's right. Sorry, I have a thing for hats and this is one of my new ones. Hmm, <laughs> so that's why I decided to wear it today. Also, uh, because I didn't, didn't uh, go get my hair done over the weekend. All right, any other questions about the food waste paper, ideas that you might have for it? Any questions about protocol? Are we going to be talking about this more in class, or is it just, or is it okay? Not, not too much more. Um, let me, let me look over here. Uh, so I want to shrink that down just a second. Sorry, I'm just gonna. gonna so right now, uh, February 25th to March 4th. So we just got done, I guess, with that discussion on dive number two. So we've got that frame of reference and we have the chapter on waste. So I think really now is, is just the time to focus on the paper outside of, yeah, what we're doing or in addition to. Yep. Uh, any other questions or ideas you have for the paper? Anything like that? This is a little unrelated, but I just want to make sure I kind of know what's happening. This week for class reading, are we supposed to do chapter seven or six, seven, eight? Six. Okay, six. Okay, yeah. cool. Uh, so we just got done with chapter five, I think, right? The test was on chapters four and five. So please start reading chapter six. I'm going to start in today with chapter six on population. Um, and I revealed those questions today in Top Hat a bit ago. So if you have not checked uh, online or announcements, you can go ahead and head over there to answer those questions. Um, yep. So chapter six is what we're doing. Uh, and then looking forward, and I know this is down the line, but where is it? Um, I'm looking at discussions here, and I know it's a bit in the future, but we are doing a population discussion. And it's not, I know we're, we're doing the population chapter now, but that video is an awesome video. And I may even end up showing part of it in class, although, you know, with the lag, probably best that you're on your own with that. But that is also something that you can watch now that although it's kind of down the line and by that time we'll be done with this chapter, you know, past this week or whatever, that I think will really help your conceptualizing population and the issues around with it. The guy who's giving the lecture, Hans Rosling, just passed away or had his continuation a couple of years ago. He's one of the most exciting people to talk about. It's like, he does stats, but he's exciting. And, he, and he's really the number one guy on population and was up and that still is really. Um, so I would watch that video right now as well, because you can never participate too early for these discussions. People forget, and then it's a few days beforehand, and they didn't do their first post a week out, but you could post two or three weeks out, you know, or whatever that might be, even though, even though that's a ways out. Does that make sense? So just an additional thing as, as you look at that. Um, all right, great. I don't think the module six notes are posted. I saw that, uh, and I will um, go ahead and uh, upload the lecture to modules right after class as well. I noticed that this morning, actually, when I was looking through the class. So, yep, thank you for the heads up. I appreciate it. All right, 
Uh, I'll quit leaning so close into the camera. <laughs> I just got new glasses. Um, and uh, let me pop over here to some of these questions. All right. We're going to look at all sorts of things over this chapter, some really interesting stuff. I have chapter six, population, a problem of quantity or quality. So does a person have a fundamental right, a fundamental human right to have as many children as you choose? So let's look at where the class was on this. Uh, I wish I had, I wish I had more kids. I wish we had had like, cause now I'm missing it when they were little, but I'm, I wish we had like maybe four or six, <laughs> but two, two is where we're at unless we adopt. Um, so let's look at this. Does the person have a fundamental? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Right, so we've got 68 people chiming in. That's pretty good. Ooh. And I like this split 51 people. Yes. People should have a fundamental human right to have as many kids as they want. Uh, 17, no, but that's a really good number, no. Not quite half, but almost. Uh, and usually we have you know, more agreement than that in this class. So I love this question. So let's talk about it as we start thinking about population. And I ask these questions at the beginning of every chapter, but really uh, this is a big chapter, right? I mean, population is connected to everything else. How much water we have has gotta be connected to how many people how much food we have, how much energy we have available to us, where people are living, what that looks like, quality of life, social justice issues. So many things that we talk about frequently are gonna intersect with this chapter. Hi, Alma. All right, gonna let Alma out real quick, sorry. Sorry, everybody, but you know the drill. All right. Uh, Elma, the famous pit bull, makes her appearance. So uh, this topic segues with many things that we've already learned about. So what do you think? Uh, why does a person, why is it okay for people to have as many kids as they want, or why not? Uh, and this is, of course, your opinion. I said yes, but I also don't know, like, what, what? causes someone to like be told who or how many kids they can have because like then you you also have to take into account like in like the issue in Venezuela and stuff like birth control access is like st stupid stupid amounts of money so like access to birth control plays a big issue and yeah like who's to say what the conditions are for it Good, good. And yeah, um, as we'll see in that Hans video, and as we discuss population in general, um, family planning, you know, over the last 40, 50, 60 years in many rural places, and education, family planning and education has made a huge impact. Um, so now people maybe aren't having six kids like they did 50 years ago, and only two are surviving. Um, but we'll look at that in more detail. Yeah, what does that look like? What are those mechanisms? Why and in what places? Do they make access to family planning ridiculously expensive? Um, I said, no, if you can't take care of a large amount of kids then you shouldn't have them. Uh, it's not fair those kids not being able to be taken care of. Kids can end up being neglected and abused. Uh, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, but but who decides? And, and do people only engage in behavior that makes babies when they know it's the right thing to do or when they're perfectly financially stable. Now, of course, I'm, I'm just looking at things from a different perspective, from a sociological perspective, saying, right, well, that, that doesn't always happen. But uh, if you're planning a family, then you have to plan around or try and plan around um, consideration for what you can afford. Um, absolutely, who else? And I'm not going to read another one quite yet. I'll, I'll see if we can do this discussion in person, or at least as much as we can. I said yes, just because it is hard to like, how do you regulate how many kids people can have, who can have them, when they can have them. But I do agree with like, yes, population is an issue. We have too many people and some people who shouldn't be having kids are having kids. But it feels impossible to regulate that. It does. And who are the people? that shouldn't be having kids, right? Like just, just how do we define that? How do we determine that? Are people in power gonna determine that? 
Are people with privilege and access to get around the system going to determine that? Is that the average person, you know, that determines that? Um, absolutely. Uh, a lot of things to consider. Good. What else? Uh, why yes or why no? I think um, like the, a good way to approach the situation, I don't exactly know how, but instead of like creating really hard laws and saying like you are not allowed to have this many kids, otherwise like you will be punished or something, like focus on education and make people want to have less kids and kind of show the benefits of that. Um, because people, you know, tend to respond better to that if they can kind of make their own decision and then like have that decision be inevitably to have less kids. Again, like I don't really know how we'd implement that on the wide scale, but I think it would work better if we could try that. Uh, absolutely, and it has it has been tried with a great deal of success. Um, and the the scenario I remember from um, the Hans Rosling lecture is India. And this is why we look at this with through a sociological lens, right? Because getting the birth control is one thing, or family planning, taking it into places where there are sociological barriers, gender barriers, child rearing expectations, who makes those decisions based on gender? Is it a patriarchy? Is, you know, is it, is uh, family planning taboo? What are women willing to risk in order to have that, you know, be the case so that so that they're managing their family size and their health and the health of their families. And yeah, wow, so much there. Um, but there are places that have made incredible impacts. And we now have decades and decades and decades and decades of data in some places um, to show just what an impact that can make. Good, absolutely. Um, I will read a couple here, I guess. It comes down to where you're from. Some countries uh, who are uh, some countries are poor, don't understand having a lot of children is a bad thing, where there's more education, people have, where there's more education, people have less kids. I think sex education, access to family planning needs an overhaul before anyone starts legislating how many kids you can have. Good. Uh, other considerations, what do you think? Um, so I said that we should not regulate it for a couple of reasons and i only thought about america here because that's the only you know country that i have experience on um one reason is there's a lot of states that don't even have um fair abortion laws and there's a lot of politicians that are against abortion and if you want to regulate uh there, I don't think that there's anything wrong necessarily with education and trying to have people have less children. I particularly don't even want children, but I'm not gonna like look at someone and say, well, I know you want seven kids, but you totally shouldn't, you know, because I feel like that's an infringement on your own body rights. And to me, that's a really important thing, like with the whole abortion thing, like my body and my choice and um, yeah, kind of just that. Good. Uh, so political considerations, availability based on education, based on then political considerations, right? Um, and, and all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're talking about abortion. And we know this is really, really, really emotionally charged. And we know this is really, really, really political. Um, and we also know the historical patterns of gender oppression. Um, with which a lot of this functions under, where uh, men aren't willing to have their bodies legislated by women, but women are supposed to have to be okay with that. So then now we're, of course, deep into the sociology of all this. Um, what's that mean? Why? What are those power relationships? Uh, who's deciding that? Um, is it fair? Does it make any sense? Is it based on science? Right, so so many considerations. Um, yeah, when we start to talk about that, and then furthermore, is there used to be anyway pretty frequent protests, and then pretty frequent counter protests over at the Planned Parenthood right across from CSU. Um, but it should be noted, I guess, as we talk about this chapter, that I think less than two percent, or only around two percent, um, of all that Planned Parenthood does would include and or be involved with abortions in the first place. So much of what they do 
is family planning. Much of what they do is education. Much of what they do is giving folks options to keep their kids. Um, so in many ways, the people that protest these places are, are going against the, the science and, and what we know in the data collection that we've done that says when options are provided, more lives are saved, uh, actually. And, and this is what happens with counseling. And this is uh, what happens in states where you have oppressive abortion laws and people have to go to other states or to other non as medical or reputable means to do so, which of course is part of this as well. Good. Um, don't think we'll ever be able to regulate it. Making contraceptives more universally available could help people being forced to have kids because they can't afford other options. Yes. Uh, and all you need to do as a student of CSU is take a look at the statistics on campus for sexually transmitted infections or sexually transmitted diseases. And just the numbers alone will make you rethink everything you know about, um, about your behavior in that regards. Uh, it's pretty intense. And if you haven't checked those out yet, I would think that that would be a very important thing. Um, and Wait, you check what out? The numbers of campus-wide for this area, for this school, sexually transmitted STDs and STIs. Um, as we look at and talk about family planning and contraception, that's in there too. Um, of course, somebody put here, but there's always cultures where contraception are heavily frowned upon and more than heavily frowned upon, you know, regulated only by certain genders, punishable by all sorts of, um, you know, violent means and things like that. Anyone remember anything? Uh, let's see. Uh, all right. All right. Good. So uh, let's describe overpopulation in one word. We kind of trying to get to where is our sense as a class? Uh, unsustainable. Wow. Number one with six people chiming in and typing in the same way. Crowded at, with six as well. Complicated three, dangerous three, scary three, concerning two, pollution two, detrimental two, congested, chaos, unsettling, unbalanced, overflow, destructive, the world, compact, fatal, exponential, catch 22, resources, bad, <laughs> humans, too many people in one area, overconsumption, overpopulation, LOL. Drowning, damaging, irresponsible, overcapacity, growing, overlooked, uh, dirty, overuse, troubling, invasive, unprepared, terrifying, populated, costly, inertia, chaotic, inevitable, boomers. Uh, I'm just going to end there. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just, I'll step out on, on the boomers comment, which I love. Um, okay. Uh, not a fantastically positive list. Um, and speaking to terms of, okay, Zoomer, speaking to terms of capacity, right? Um, absolutely. So let me look over here at how concerned are you about global population growth? I ask this about waste, I ask this about access to food, water, you name it. So how concerned are you, at least within this class? Uh, you all right? What'd you drop? Oh my goodness. Did you fall over? <laughs> oh, wow. All right. I've got a son that leans back on his chair, but he'll never really fall over, right? Love it. Okay. How concerned are you population growth? Uh, we've got 69 respondents, 37 very, 29 little, two not at all, and one D. So why did you answer? Did you answer because I said, Population is connected to lots of things. I, I mean, this is a lot of people who are very concerned about this. We weren't as concerned about availability of water uh, or food, uh, I don't think. And as far as like this capacity, yes, people were concerned, but there's a lot of people expressing a lot of concern. So why? Why so concerned about population or why very concerned or, or why not at all? I said I was very concerned because I think it's a topic that's overlooked very easily, especially in developed countries. Like here in the US, we don't really, I think it's not talked about as much because we don't see the direct effects, but I think it's important to note that like we will see the effects. I mean, we see them in other places and it's a global issue. It's not just like a few countries here and there and it's not just developing countries. So I think it's serious. I mean, any issue that's being overlooked at that great magnitude really needs to be, I think, kind of considered more. 
Yeah, um, and it's interesting. Again, there are many places in the world that I, I feel like, because of geography and size, internalize that quicker, right? They internalize the space issues. They internalize infrastructure issues. They internalize food and water issues, population issues. I, I don't want to let us off the hook here in this country, but it seems like geography and having so much space plays a role in us not quite internalizing something as this big. Um, because I do feel like it is very overlooked here. Or I feel like in other places in the world, it is, it is very like they're on top of it, meaning it's critical. You know, they've reached, they've reached some pretty intense masses with how many people are in cities, how many of those cities exist. And of course we know more and more people are living in big cities. Yeah, good. Uh, why else very concerned or not at all or whatever you might've listed? I also put very um, just because I think it is like at the center of like all these problems um, that can arise like it, it has an impact like on our food, on our, you know, our water sources, our, you know, our environmental health. And I think that like it has, I just think it has such a big impact on like all these different factors that it would be like, it'd be silly not to like think that that is, you know, something that could change all these different things. Right, excellent. Um, all right, good, good. Uh, anybody else? I'll move on to the next one. Don't wanna rush, but if somebody's gonna say something, I don't wanna cut you off. All right, let's get to the blame game. Ha ha, Woohoo! I grew up in America. I want somebody to blame, damn it. Uh, so let's turn to the classroom. Who did we blame? And Obviously, you know, my, my take on this ultimately is like, does it matter who or what we blame? We've just got to figure it out. But of course, in fact, it does matter, um, you know, what we blame or who we assign blame to, particularly if that gets us into discrimination of some sort or bias of some sort or social justice issues of some sort, which it often does. So let's look, and this is one of the most awesome even splits I've ever seen in a class. Uh, so let me, I can pull this up just a little bit, make sure I've got them all. Okay. So, um, 67 respondents, uh, who or what is to blame? Oh, I put who or what is to blame for the most, for the first one medical. Oh my gosh. The individual, I guess is number one, although it doesn't say that, but I think some people understand that medical industry, 23 global food production, eight lack of government birthing restriction, 19. So there's actually, there's actually quite a few people here more often, I think, than not, or than usual. Maybe that's because that first one might have been like a little bit weird. Um, as far as like, yeah, look, uh, we could look globally and say there's a lack of birthing restrictions. Um, although, right, we will see later in this chapter just how well the idea of, uh, and you already know what I'm going to say, but how well the idea of a, like a one child policy, how well would that go over in this country and this culture? Don't answer yet because we'll talk about that next time. But let me go ahead and pull the, uh, the uh, PowerPoint up and let me screen share it for y'all. All righty, here we go. Um, oh, that's, uh, that's the stork. If you didn't know how people got their babies, just thought I would provide that piece of science for you, right? Just leading off the chapter. Why did people decide on a stork? Like, is it like people in like cartoons doing like like that that the stork was going to be the and remember if you ever watch any of those old cartoons it was a drunk stork because the stork would always deliver the wrong baby somewhere right i feel like and now i'm feeling like this segues into peppy le pew like because they deliver a, a skunk instead of a cat or vice versa and now and now we've just run run the gamut of that all right uh do you have a, a human right to have as many children how concerned are you who is to blame? Yes, individuals was the first one. Uh, medical industry, global food production, lack of government birthing restrictions. Okay. Um, so uh, exponential growth. We know this, but a, a good term to understand, right? Population is this evolving concern. Um, I will say this before we get to that Hans Rosling video, that even though this is connected to so many different things, 
he does come up with a concept that has a lot of traction, I think, of peak population, um, meaning that perhaps this exponential growth that we look at isn't as exponential once we get to a certain point. Um, but we'll talk about that later. So exponential growth, growth at a constant rate, resource use at a constant rate, economic uh, activity at a constant rate. And no, um, our economy, economists, a lot of economists would say, like I mentioned before, that we really stopped growing in the 70s or 80s, and it's all sort of the way that we measure it now. But uh, there is not exponential or infinite growth, really, for the economy as well. That's all tied to people and resources and, you know, uh, global constructs of, of economic institutions. <laughs> um, birth rates, if we look at the ratio of live births per 1,000 of the population, um, and I don't have the infant mortality rate, but I do know that our country is somewhere in the 30s. Um, we don't do birthing as well as the technology that we have access to should uh, or suggest or might suggest that we do. Um, now, we talk about this birth rate in China. China uh, slashed their birth rates uh, with a one-child policy. Now, we will talk about whether or not this might work and how that was implemented, um, but that would be a government program or law where we would say, now you are only allowed to have one child. Pass it through legislation, we mandate it. Uh, well, that's how we would do it here. Different process in China. Um, but you would set up a system where you penalize families with more than one child. And there is a really interesting, though very tragic and very intense, and I wouldn't recommend it to everybody, but there is a really interesting documentary that was on Netflix about this, about the impact of the one child policy on China. It was from the perspective of many midwives who were forced to go around and do these forced abortions in these different towns um, and what that looked like. And then of course, um, you know, who does that happen to? And how do countries or cultures start to value certain genders over others? So of course, this was happening much more to people who they perceived um, as being associated with the identity of female. Um, uh, as far as like the bias uh, in as far as, you know, those, the abortion, the forced abortion pieces and who they would have going around doing that and who, what families would deal with that, how, how would they hide it? Uh, it's intense. Now, of course, if you want to get around it, there are loopholes, right? You can impose a social maintenance fee, which means um, that, yes, now we're, of course, into the realm of social justice, which means that if you have enough money, you can have a larger family. And I think on one hand, you know, my students are like, well, that makes sense, <laughs> right? Like, if you have enough money, you could probably pay that fee, but you also have enough money to take care of these kids. So what would that look like? And then, of course, uh, in other ways, um, you know, it's creating a social justice disparity where you are allowing, uh, I mean, when we're talking about life and the sanctity of life and creating a family and, and what's that really mean, um, then of course, there's a big gap there in social justice for people who are poor, for people that um, are gonna have more than one child because in addition to like, your state expectations or what laws you make, you also have the reality that I addressed before of being a human being. And the reality is abstinence, I'm not making like a value judgment based on, on abstinence based on being like conservative or liberal. It's just not something as a sociologist that people seem to be good at, right? So like, there's also that we could put in that. There's like family planning, there's a one child policy, there's abstinence, but who's going to enforce abstinence and has that ever worked for human beings um, and how and, and what did that look like and was it detrimental and obviously, right? So um, that's another part to consider. That just doesn't seem very realistic from a human behavior uh, observation standpoint and practice. And certainly that's reflected in, in the population numbers and that exponential growth piece. All right, so we obviously as sociologists need to look at the relationship between, whoop, between uh, population uh, and resource consumption, population resource use, and population waste, or population and resource waste. So understand that, mark that, that'll be on the test. Um, because we wouldn't be getting a complete picture. We wouldn't be getting a multi-dimensional picture. We wouldn't be getting a very diverse picture. Um, if we were just looking at 
the impact of, I mean, just what the individual family or how many kids you have. Um, so it's important because our ecological footprint is 30 times that of India, 100 times that of some of the poorest countries. And then we get into that piece in sociology, and you can write this down, but where we talk about the other, right? Like, they don't do that, right? They have so many kids over there, and it's completely irresponsible, and we don't do that. And they're, they, they, you know, anyway, the idea is, obviously, as sociologists, we want to look, what's our resource consumption? Because if we have a population, maybe the United States doesn't have, like, the greatest per how many people we have population on the planet. How's it growing? How many resources do we use? How many resources do we waste? What's that look like with other countries that have similar population growth? Um, so we want to look at uh, all these social structures, right? Because all this population um, discussion circulates around that, right? They are mediated heavily by these social structures. And so we're looking to, as social scientists, find the reasons behind these growth rates. Because the reasons behind the growth rates aren't just that people like to have sex. That's, that's, uh, that's not it, right? So we have to be careful not to blame country with higher fertility rates. Um, and, and so we look at maybe which society or culture has the biggest impact, right? Um, on the earth, uh, on resource use, on, you know, the, for the people that they have using this and in this way. So that's what we want to look at as sociologists, right? Uh, we know that our world population now is seven, 700, seven, 7 billion, maybe 700 some million. We'll take a look at that in just a minute. Um, Going to be 9 billion by 2050, and we will look at the population clock. Um, but I think what we have to understand, or what you have to understand, or what we have to understand, whatever, collectively uh, in this class, um, is that, and I'm not sure how many years ago that was now, at the end of the middle of the 60s, when JFK was president, the world population was 3 billion. And it didn't take, I mean, it was either by the year 2000 or before then, we had doubled that to 6 billion in a period of like 30 years. So in a very short amount of time, this is why, I, although it's the most boring documentary and inconvenient truth, right? And we've talked about that, but he does somewhere there and I'll show us in this, um, it's in the PowerPoint, but just, how many generations, how long in human history it's gone with relatively the same population, then we barely hit our first billion, and, and, and then all of a sudden, boom. Uh, and so the rate at which that exponential growth piece, when we look here at this population clock, um, let's take a look at it now. I've got it going in the background. I'll do a, a little narrating of it, and uh, let's take a look at this. Okay. Here it is, it's the population clock. And let's jump in worth one birth every nine seconds. That's right, push, push. And this is a baby being born in, there we go, got a baby being born. And somebody else is on their way and they're waiting, 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 waiting. And, and a tragedy is about to unfold, but not quite yet. And oh, congratulations, another baby is born and another birth is on the way. Finally, we've lost somebody. Okay, there we go. Push. Here we go, and hey, ding, 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 and everybody's happy, and finally, there, we've lost another person. Okay, right? This is a really, really interesting and telling website. Um, so yeah, I, I, we are at 7 billion, 749 million. Um, we can look at the 10 most populous countries. Uh, we can look at what age we're looking at. And this is what people who study population like Hans Rosling do. What's that mean? How many people were born in that generation? When they die off, what's that look like? What's the replacement? Um, what's family planning look like? How has that changed? So we've got one birth every nine seconds, one death every 11, which is a net gain of one person uh, every 40 seconds, right? So that's the exponential piece that we're talking about. Um, even though, even though this has been slowed, uh, you know, somewhat. Um, so you can look at highest density places in, in this country. You can look at countries. You can look at within the United States. Uh, there, this is a great data piece. So as of yesterday, the population of the United States was 330,139,614. So to me, uh, I think there's uh, a lot of value in being able to look at these stats in real time 
right? What's that feel like? What's that net gain? And now we look globally. Um, and so how do we how do we deal with that? How do we address it? Maybe, maybe I don't have to say how do we slow it down? And maybe I do, right? Um, and what's that mean? So go ahead and that link is built in actually uh, to the PowerPoint. Uh, so if you want to visit that on your own and let me go ahead and share that again. So if everybody had the same footprint, because now we're looking at, right, not just um, number of people, uh, but we're looking at what that looks like as far as, as far as what people use, the ecological footprint. If we did that, the earth could only sustain 1.4 billion. Um, you know, meaning that a child born, if we're looking at life cycle carbon impact, child born in the United States is more than 160 times that of a child born in Bangladesh. Even if it was twice that, that would be a big deal. If it was 10 times that, again, right? Statistical significance is pretty big here. So <clears throat> what's future world population growth gonna look like? Um, where's it gonna be? Uh, and what kind of impacts does this have for us uh, sort of globally for our future and not just here, right? So does fewer people mean fewer environmental problems? And let's take a look at what the class said. And the last question for today, uh, does fewer people mean fewer environmental problems? And uh, 42 people said yes, 23 people, about half said no, four people said C, this is always a good one. Um, what do you think? Why yes, why no? Does fewer people mean fewer environmental problems? And not only yes and no, but in what ways and why? If there are fewer people, there are fewer resources being used. Like even in a single household, like if I had four kids as opposed to two, I'd be buying a lot more food. I'd probably be driving a lot more, you know, like I'd be, my house would have to be bigger. So I'd be using more gas to heat my house. Good. Yeah. Just statistically, when you look at that piece and next week, I'm going to start driving the boys to school five days a week. And I haven't done that in a year. And, oh, oh, it's already hurting me. Not because I don't want them to go get an education, just the driving through Fort Collins part of it. <laughs> I just, I'm just considering that one of the blessings of this last year. Didn't have to drive in Fort Collins much at all. Loved it. Um, but yeah, a lot changes when you add a couple of people or subtract a couple of people. Why else? Or why did you answer yes or no? Fewer people means fewer problems. I think it could kind of be either. It's hard because... Yes, there would be like less use of resources, but also based on our patterns, especially, you know, here in America, I feel like be like, okay, well, there's not as much people so we can take up more room like we can build bigger houses we can. I don't know, it's hard. It's, I can see it going both ways. But I think we'd be like, oh, well, we have more room to be selfish and <laughs> more for us. We don't have to, you know, share as much. Right. So maybe not, maybe not perceiving that we would have to slow down on that resource use, that there's, that there's like a connection even, right? Just like mm -hmm. now we could do even more. <laughs> I could take you know, 20 minute showers and eat twice, yeah. whatever. Okay, good. Who else? Um, yeah, fewer people, fewer problems. Why? I kind of agree with what Riley, I think, said. Uh, I said C because I feel like it depends on what we do with resources and how we use them and you know yeah so like if, if we continue to use stuff at the rate we do we're screwed regardless <laughs> of like population but like right. if we <laughs> yeah if the resource use is exponential regardless of extra people right uh yeah good good um uh, I see that we're being joined. Adriana is, has a guest that's joining the class right now. Might be vice versa. All right, who else? Uh, fewer people, fewer problems. I think housing also plays like a big role in this, um, like where people are gonna live. Um, so for continuing like population is growing, I mean, we're just gonna like, you see it in Fort Collins, like 
it's just the neighborhoods in these suburbs are just going to like keep growing, um, which also affects, you know, the natural wildlife and um, just the amount of space that is, is not natural anymore. Yeah, Hughes Stadium. Uh, I know that there's that vote that's going up to keep, keep Hughes Stadium an open space, which would be fantastic. Um, I'm biased, but uh, where else is there for people to drive in town? Like there's no more water to get out to these new developments. So they're just going building up, but there's no infrastructure to hold this many vehicles and there's no place else to drive. And we actually have, and I'll talk about in the transportation chapter, but Auntie Stone, does anybody know who Auntie Stone is? Super, go look her up. Super amazing, hardcore, hardcore. Uh, original member of the Fort Collins community. And I'm not, I'm just going to, I'm just going to say that, go look up Auntie Stone. But um, whereas most towns in the United States, uh, you know, had kind of a one lane thing, there was a perception here of the growth and what that meant. And that's why the downtown actually has more like, like double lanes of parking versus so many types of towns that kind of didn't, didn't look at that ahead of time because those buildings are set right? You can't build, there's no more room to build roads in much of this town. So how is that even in your own community, right? Um, related, related to population growth. Good. Uh, anybody else? All right. Well, uh, fantastic human beings, good people, and all my wonderful students. Uh, that's where I'm going to wrap it up for today. Uh, next time. Um, uh, so when I get done with class, expect in announcements for me to post the um, uh, sources, your three required sources for the food waste paper. And I will also put, even though I'm, I'm just working my way through it right now, I will uh, unmute or publish chapter six in as far as the uh, PowerPoint goes. Are there any questions from anybody about what's going on? Nope. Well, the snow is still out there. Okay, and I highly recommend you go play in it. We ripped the top off of a cooler yesterday uh, so we could make big bricks. And we started in on a really fantastic uh, snow fort. That's about five feet now. We're gonna try and incorporate this uh, big umbrella that we have, cover it totally. We might uh, watch a movie out there later. I have no idea, but uh, we're gonna see if we can finish the snow fort later on this afternoon. So get out there and uh, have some fun in the snow or stay warm. There's a lot of people that look out there and they're like, I don't know, I have no interest in that whatsoever. I respect that too. Um, so be good people, do good things, stay safe, keep masking up, all right? I know you don't wanna hear this, nobody wants to hear it, but we are gonna it up again if we all don't keep masking up. And that means my dad who has worn a mask spiritually and religiously and just got his vaccination about a week ago and a buddy of mine sent me a picture of him walking out of union dairy getting ice cream and i didn't see a mask on him and i didn't see a mask around his neck and so i called him the other day and i said oh yeah hey dad you're still wearing your mask aren't you and he's like oh yeah and I'm like, what about that ice cream place mother sucker you better put your mask on anyway um so yeah i'm taking it to my 80 year old dad if you just saw the latest south park with the old folks driving around laughing at people because they've got their, um, they've got the seniors driving around laughing because they've got their vaccinations. Let's not let our guard up yet. Wear your masks. Again, how many times do I have to say this? Look, 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 way more handsome, way more handsome, just easy. Now, I'm not saying that about you, but most people out there, this could just be a thing forever and I'd be fine with it, all right? Be a superhero, wear a mask, keep each other safe. And um, yeah, be good people and do good things. Talk to you later, everybody. Peace. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Yep. You have any questions? Let me know.